So I'm here on this talk speaking as vice chair of the MBench working group. Um, MBench is a project initiated by Dave Patterson that grew out of a frustration that when you ask people how good their processor or their compiler is, they quote a core mark score. Um, and that all that matters is your core mark score and nothing else. And a feeling that that was, in some sense, rather one-dimensional um, uh, as a measure of giving you any insight into a processor or an ecosystem. So a group of us got together under Dave's leadership at the start of the year, the four people who I'm co-presenting for, um, and we met each month and we tried to come up with a better benchmark suite and this talk is just to introduce it to you. So we wanted to learn from history. Okay, let's look at what's worked in the past. So if you look going back, where are some big benchmarks that people know? Linpack, if you're in the HPC world, of course you know Linpack. Drystone, a very early idea of a synthetic integer benchmark. Um, spec, actually, if you like, the first big serious suite of benchmark programs. Core mark, which came out of that stuff as a single free benchmark, if you like, the idea of you can't keep benchmarks private. And I put one in there, which is a very new one, which is MLPerf, which is a benchmark suite for machine learning, specifically for machine learning training. And that's still not even you know, fully there. It's, it's got release 0.5. And we're going back, in the case of Limpact to 1977, Drystone 84, Spec 1989. So we're going back a few decades. Okay? And let's look at what well, they have different pieces. Limpact, of course, HPC. Spec is more looking at the Unix server mark. Core mark, very much in the embedded world. MLPerf, obviously, machine learning. Drystone, if anything, trying to assess system programmability. Okay. Quality reputation, I think it's fair to say the one-offs all have a fairly low reputation for quality, partly because they've been around a long time and people know how to game them, um, and because they are very one-dimensional. Spec, much higher reputation. It's a bigger thing. Um, the downside of spec, of course, is it's the one that's not free. Um, and all of these are easy to port and bring up on a new target. Um, only spec is reliably updated on a regular basis. MLPerf plans to be. Okay? And if you look at them, spec has a suite of programs, MLPerf has a suite of programs, the others are just a single program. They give you one look at a system. Okay? And Limpack, uh, Spec, Cormark, and MLPerf all have an organization to look after them. And that means that there's a belief that they won't die because someone's done them and then forgets about them. And they generally provide a summary score. Sometimes in Limpack, it's the discredited floating point operations per second. Drystone, it's a speed ratio. How do you compare to other drystone runs? Spec's interesting because it uses a geometric mean. And that's why I put it in green. It's a good thing. Geometric mean helps to make sure no one part of the benchmark dominates. Um, core mark is just a speed ratio. Um, MLPerf is interesting because it is a speed ratio type thing, but it also looks at the standard deviation. Not only how much is the average behavior, but how much is the variation across the benchmark. And interestingly, if you look at the two that have tended to get the ticks in the box for doing good things, they both come into the category, they're developed by a mixture of academia and industry. And that's a message we took away. And we looked at some less well-known benchmarks. Embassy, now I know in the embedded world, of course, you will know Embassy. It tends not to be quoted as a benchmark because it doesn't have a summary score. And in fact, all of these don't have a summary score. There's MyBench, which was an early free um, benchmark suite, quite widely used in the open, the free and open source community. Beebs. Uh, which I was involved with, came out of research into compilers for energy efficiency, and I've talked about it here in the past. And TackleBench is a more modern, uh, newer 
attempt to collect a set of benchmarks, in this case, for worst case execution time. And all of these, interestingly, all are suites of benchmarks. They all fail to have um, a summary score. They don't have, well, with the exception of Embassy, they don't have an organization to run them. And they're all free except for the one that has got an organization, which is Embassy, which is expensive to join. You have to be part of the consortium. And again, if you look there, you've got industry or academia and Beebs, which gets a lot of green things there. And I know I wrote these slides and I wrote Beebs, so I'm perhaps biased. But again, academia and industry. So we took seven lessons away from that when we came to put mBench together. It must be free. It must be easy to port and run. If you look at some of those other, the, the less common benchmark suites, they're not that easy to port. It must be real programs, not synthetic programs. We want to actually capture what real programmers write, not what some imagined synthetic view is. It's only going to live if it has a supporting organization behind it. That, that, that's essential for longevity. It needs to report a summarizing score. So you need to have a way that people can say, this is what this benchmark means. And we like the idea of geometric means and standard deviations. Indeed, even better geometric standard deviations because they see the variation. I'll take questions at the end, I think, Ernie. Okay. And strong theme comes out. You can't do it just academics and you can't do it just with industry. So you need us both in there. So the, last, the first six months of this year, we had four of us working on this, um, mostly face-to-face -face meetings in Sci-5's offices. In June, we talked about it at the Risk Five meeting in um, Zurich, and we opened it up to all. And now anyone can join in and take part, and we've got a wider participation. And we were very keen that though this had come out of Dave Patterson, who was very well known for Risk Five, it was only going to work if it was a benchmark for everyone. So we moved out from Risk Five, and it is part of the free and open source Silicon Foundation, and that's what that little logo on the right is. It's the free and open source Silicon Foundation. So the people who do open risk and run Orconf, we're under their umbrella and we're explicitly open and free and not tied to any one architecture. And we've got our website and if you go there, it'll give you the pointers to all the things that matter. And our goal is to have this sufficiently tidied up and polished that we can launch it at Embedded World in Nuremberg next February. So where are we? We've got 19 benchmarks. We focused initially on the IoT class device, up to 64 kilobytes of ROM and RAM. We'd like a couple more programs. We'd like to capture encrypted uh, DSA, oh, sorry, elliptic curve DSA, um, but we haven't yet got a program for that. We think we might be able to use the mBench program arm of sort of suggested that. That might be a good one for that. And we'd like to capture something Bluetooth LE or something like that. And so if anyone wants to work on those, please put your hands up. Beebs, which this grew out of, this is really a subset of Beebs, used auto tools and it used Deja GNU to run. You don't need the full power of Deja GNU and if you want to run on anything other than Linux, then you need something simpler. Again, you don't need the full caboodle of Automake and actually it's a bit inflexible if you want to do rather unusual compiling builds. So we've switched over to a Python framework of some simple scripts to build and run the benchmarks. And that will change in the long term. I think Western Digital are hoping to bring forward their um, build system um, when that gets opened um, later in the year. And then we'll have a, a enterprise class build system. And we need to get more data. We're at the stage of trying to get data. We haven't got much on real hardware or other architectures. So let's just quickly finish with a look at some results. Code speed, I've only got some speed for RV32, and I've only got it on one cycle accurate model of the pulp core from ETH Zurich. And I'm able to compare. GCC is by definition the baseline. Everything is relative here. You measure it compared to a baseline. The baseline is GCC running on the risky core at one megahertz. And you can see that code speed, LLVM is comparable. 
the old embedded ABI is a bit slower. GCC LTO makes it go faster. And we've got some new optimizations for size, and they actually make it a bit slower. Okay? And on the whole, you want to be as large as possible. And oh, I've hit the wrong button. And we've got compiled code size, and we can see that LLVM is a bit bigger than GCC. Um, GCC embedded ABI and LLVM embedded ABI make things a bit bigger, which is maybe not what you'd expect. GCC LTO is really good for code size. Um, LLVM save restore makes LLVM as good as GCC. Um, and if you put some more size ops, we can make it smaller. If you use combined elimination talk coming up next, you can make it smaller. And interestingly, ARM beats all of these. Um, so notice here, I've presented here a score and an error bar, which is the geometric standard deviation. So you can see the variation and you can see LTO stands out as having considerable variability. So in summary, there's a suite there, focus on IoT class, score as a geometric mean and standard even relative to a baseline platform. We've got an organization to sustain it. We're planning to release it. And please help. And there's all the information, the organization, the GitHub repository, and the mailing list. Thank you very much. And while we switch over, I'll take one question from Nick, who's behind you. And if Craig, if you'd like to come down and get ready to do your talk. Thank okay. you very much. Jeremy, you want to have um, the, source, the, the benchmark to be free, but you also want to have real programs. And I would have guessed that in the embedded world, most real programs are not free. Um, there are enough that are real that are free. It is a challenge. Um, and these are real programs that are used in the real world. People use um, the Nettle library for cryptography, for example, which is a free library in real products, which is some of the programs in Nettle libraries. They use the uh, SGLib uh, stats library and so forth. So far, it's been good. It, yeah, there's compromises everywhere. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. So we get through them all. Over to Craig.